of waging small business warfare podcast teaching davids how to defeat goliaths now here's your host mark anthony peterson welcome back to the podcast for entrepreneurs startups and business mavericks if you're not a maverick you don't have to go home but you got to get up out of this podcast Guess what, guys? Episode 15 is our one-year anniversary episode, and we are celebrating. Sign up for our newsletter at sierra.com for a chance to win a copy of my book, Gorilla Panur, Small Business Strategy for David's Wanting to Defeat Goliath. We also have an Amazon sweepstakes giveaway, and we're giving away some cool electronics. Check out the link to the Amazon sweepstakes in the show notes. In past episodes, we defined guerrillapreneurs as entrepreneurs who integrate sharing gig and circular loop economies into their business design as a way to conserve cash, cash that will be invested in disruptive technology that I call slingshot technology. Episode 15 is a mastermind interview episode where we have a conversation with an entrepreneur about issues that they face in their quest to create value. In today's episode, we talk with award-winning singer-songwriter and musicpreneur Alika Hope. And we feature her new song, In Real Life, or IRL, which focuses on the importance of kindness on social media. Now, she's going to premiere this song on Monday, November the 13th, 2017, on World Kindness Day, the same day this podcast is released. That was Alika Hope. She's our feature guest and our feature artist for this episode, singing her new single, In Real Life, or IRL. We'll feature a longer clip at the end of the episode. Hollywood and social media glamorize and romanticize the life of an entrepreneur. But like every other profession, being an entrepreneur, you face immense pressure, stress, and anxiety when trying to launch your startup. And many of these startups are launched by solopreneurs who don't have anyone to help them de-escalate the daily pressure. A 2013 study by Marno Chappelle stated that entrepreneurs are more likely to experience mental health conditions than the general public. The study goes on to say that these mental health concerns are reported in 72% of entrepreneurs compared to a mere 7% of the general public. A University of California study that focused on the link between entrepreneurship and mental illness found that 49% of entrepreneurs surveyed were dealing with at least one mental illness such as ADD, ADHD, bipolar disorder, addiction, depression, or anxiety. And about one third of the entrepreneurs struggled with two or more illnesses. I guess Aristotle had it right when he said, no great mind has ever existed without a touch of madness. So why are such a high percent of individuals who live with these mental conditions attracted to being entrepreneurs and launching startups? The best answer is these mental concerns often give the individuals a competitive advantage when launching a startup. According to Deborah Carpenter, author of the article Genius in Madness, Entrepreneurs Affected by Mental Health Condition, 
she states that the lows of depression might give way to a very smart solution or idea. A manic episode can sometimes enlighten. ADHD prompts fast decision making and combined these struggles may incubate tremendous creativity that inspires would-be entrepreneurs to take chances on their ideas. And I tend to agree with Carpenter. These mental conditions give individuals the clarity and sometimes the foresight to manage risk in ways that others cannot. Some of the world's greatest entrepreneurs suffered from various mental issues. In his book, America's Obsessives, Joshua Kendall noted that several entrepreneurs and leaders like Thomas Jefferson, marketing genius Henry Hines, librarian Melville Dewey, aviator Charles Lindbergh, beauty tycoon Estee Lauder, baseball slugger Ted Williams, and tech guru Steve Jobs all struggled with psychiatric maladies. Steve Jobs could not stop designing products. Once when he was admitted to ICU, Jobs ripped off his oxygen mask and insisted that the doctor improve its design. Estee Lauder could not stop touching women's faces everywhere she went, on the street, in the elevator, in grocery stores. Hines had a compulsion for measuring everything in sight. He never left home without a measuring tape. Melville Dewey had a fixation from childhood with the number 10, with, which led him to devise the Dewey Decimal Classification System, the Google search engine of its day. Aviator Charles Lindbergh was an order aficionado. He kept track of his children's infractions. He made his wife, Anne, track all the household expenditures right down to the last penny. Thomas Jefferson, considered America's first Renaissance man, suffered from clinical depression and would stay in his room weeks at a time. Despite the successes of these incredible entrepreneurs, there is a dark side. Lean startups, for the most part, don't have the self-care resources available to its employees. And unfortunately, this lack of resources is impacting the success of these startups. According to Fortune magazine, 13% of startups fail because their founders have lost focus. 9% fail because the founders have lost their passion. 8% fail due to founder burnout, meaning that 30% of startups fail due to the emotional state of their founders. Yes, Joshua Kendall's list of super achievement diseases which include love of order, lists, rules, schedules, detail, cleanliness, or people with OCPD who are addicted to work and that are control freaks can produce some amazing outcomes, but it can also produce some amazing darkness if you don't have the resources or the people around you who can help pull you out of that darkness when everything is going wrong. According to Chris Gorey, between 2011 and 2015, several high-profile suicides rocked the startup world and brought light to the issue of mental health, including Austin Hines, a biotech entrepreneur and founder of Cambrian Genomics, Aaron Swartz, the co-founder of Reddit, and Jody Sherman, the founder of Ecomom. God rest their souls. In my interview with Alika Hope, we talk about her song and how social media can be used as a way to reach those who are suffering from loneliness and depression. Alika is the co-founder and president of the Ray of Hope Project, which works with organizations across the U.S. to address issues of social justice through music and dialogue. She recently won a Gold Music Award for her album, Hope for a Motherless Child, and has received awards from numerous other agencies. The motto for the Ray of Hope Project is Feel the Music, Change the World. Here's my interview with Alika Hope. Today we have a very special show. 
as we're going to be talking about entrepreneurship and mental health coming out of the darkness. And today we have a very special person that we're interviewing on the show, Ms. Alika Hope. She has a song and a video that speaks to the heart of the issues that we're going to discuss on the podcast. And before we go any further, I want to first just again thank you, Ms. Hope, for being on the podcast, and and thank you for inspiring so many people through song and music and visual images to look at some of the tougher images that we face in today's society. Well, thank you so much for having me on the show, Mark. I'm very excited to be here. Well, tell, tell us about yourself. Give us a little background on who you are and how do you get to this point to, you know, be a musicpreneur and, and, and someone who tackles these sorts of issues? Well, let's see a little about myself. I'm originally from the state of Oregon, and then I went to the University of Notre Dame for my bachelor's degree, and I majored in sociology, and I had a dance minor across the way at St. Mary's College. They let us take a minor at the all-girls college. Uh, and then I continued on to New York City, which was my dream place. I always wanted to live since I was four years old. And I went to Columbia University where I finished uh, my master's degree. And um, I think what got me really started in all this music is, you know, my mother says that I my first word was, ta-da. Yeah, she always tells me that story. But um, I think from the time I was a toddler, music was in my blood. And uh, my very first professional singing was with the gospel choir uh, at my church. And then I did a lot of musical theater and opera. And I felt like I was always trying to fit the role on stage. You know, I was always trying to fit the character, and I wasn't really able to be myself. And so I started doing more concerts, um, particularly of African-American spirituals, and uh, I would sing at weddings and funerals and then just do concerts. And that's kind of how everything grew. And it was through doing the African-American spirituals and talking about the coded messages behind them, where particularly it was white audience members who would say, wow, I didn't know all this about history, and discussions would start happening about social justice. And that kind of led to the work I've done with music and social justice, which I put a lot about on Twitter and started developing a lot of Twitter followers and making friends on Twitter. And one of them reached out to me that he was really struggling because of a personal issue he had. And he told me about this issue one Saturday. By Sunday, I had written this song, and the song is called IRL, which stands for In Real Life. And the whole message behind the song was the people that you see behind the screen on Twitter, Instagram, whoever they are, those are real people with real issues. And they're also real people who can be your friend. So I chose the name IRL because it's almost a twist, right, on real life. Like what is real life? If you are suffering, if you are lonely, you should reach out to people. They don't have to be next door to you. A lot of people like this this gentleman find themselves isolated and alone. And who do they turn to? Well, he turned to me. And even though, you know, he's in Chicago and I'm in New York City, we had a whole conversation. And here's the song that was written because of him. (laughs) That kind of sums it up. Interesting. You didn't start with just the song. You you took that and explored that topic in, in, in a video. Very powerful images of a young girl that seems to be struggling with some of the issues that you just alluded to. The video came to me in some visions. And, uh, I found a director that I really liked working with, and I said, this is the thought process I have. I see a girl who is trying to kill herself and that people come along and um, help her out, little angels. And then there's another scene of a man who's lonely, and it's based on the gentleman from Twitter. And then it cuts away to me singing. And then at the very end, the vision is the girl being saved because she's found someone to rely on. And so... I had always wanted to do a video. I produced a CD a couple years ago that actually won several awards, but I'd never done a music video. So this summer I said I better do it now or never, and here we go. Have you found that the this issue of mental health, of loneliness, people not feeling in touch with the life around them, are are people struggling to put a voice to that, and do you hope this video brings that sort of issue to the forefront? Yeah, for me, yes. Um, I see all the time people are struggling, and it's twofold for me, the video, is at the very end I have the National Suicide Hotline phone number, but it's also about just being kind to people in your daily walk, and your daily life, which is why we're releasing it on World Kindness Day, is that you don't know who around you, someone in the grocery store, someone in the library might be struggling with mental illness or even just some really tough problem, and just an act of kindness 
can make a difference in someone's life. That's a, an important message that I want to emphasize in this episode because people will say, well, Mark, you know, you talk a lot about business and a lot about entrepreneurship. What does that have to do with uh, those business topics? And quite frankly, entrepreneurs are the one group within society that has the, the highest rate of mental illness. Forty to 50 percent of the entrepreneurs had at least one form of mental illness and 30% suffering from, from two types. Uh, as a personal testimony, when I launched my last startup, it was just myself and my business partner, and he was on the West Coast, I was on the East Coast. And so there were many times when it was just the two of us trying to push a rock up a hill, but there were many nights when it just felt like you're completely alone and you don't always have a good day and things that you build don't always work and the customers don't always appreciate it. And you start to internalize mm -hmm. those feelings of dread and despair. And like you said, if you don't have someone that you can talk those emotions through, they can become very powerful. Yep. Um, and it's interesting, as you were talking, it makes sense to me about the high percentage of people that are entrepreneurs with some kind of mental illness because a lot of people I know who have started businesses on their own was because they didn't fit in with everybody else. And so... Sometimes you don't fit in with anybody else, even if you have just social anxiety. Maybe you'll go and just start your own business because you feel like that's where you could belong. And so I'm actually not surprised by those numbers. Um, I hope that, though, through the work that I do, through people listening to this podcast and other things, that entrepreneurs can bind together knowing that they're not alone. Right. Absolutely. I think you, you did. You nailed it right on the head. Some of the studies that I've come across point exactly to that sort of correlation that people who – suffer from certain types of mental illness, particularly obsessive compulsive personality disorder, mm. tend to be entrepreneurs. Steve Jobs, for example, suffered from OCPD. And I, I think one of the authors of the article uh, phrased it as saying the OCPD didn't paralyze him with the constant thoughts. They inspired him. And he was a was a knee freak, a, a cleanliness freak, at times wanting to get down on his knees and in the factory where they produce the products and looking for specks of dust, saying that if you know we can't keep this place clean, how do you expect us to run a technology company? So that sort of obsessive behavior led to some magnificent, beautiful, even artistic technology, but it also haunted him in many ways. So you, you're, you're right. That behavior, because it can isolate you in a mainstream corporate job, really allows itself to flourish if you are able to explore those passions as an entrepreneur. Yep. Have you have you found that? I mean, that being a musicpreneur and the journey that you've been on, I mean, you've wrote, produced video songs. You, you have the, the Ray <laughs> of Hope project. I mean, that, that's a lot of activity that puts you around a lot of people, but are there times when you find that uh, those four walls closing in on you? Um. What I, actually, what I see a lot of in the community, the artistic community, is a lot of drug and alcohol abuse. And I think maybe there's abuse than in the typical, typical, what is typical, but in the business world. But I think, I don't know that music causes you to use drugs as much as people who are musicians are very much in touch with their, with everything because they're emotional people. And sometimes they use drugs to tune out all of the noise that's around them. And so that's something that I've seen more of the more I got involved. Um, myself, personally, I haven't used drugs, um, just say no. I grew up with Nancy Reagan always saying just say no. Um, but I, I'm, I see it a lot. And I learn not to judge the people I work with that use drugs because it's an addiction. And I don't know their story, and I don't know, you know, where they're coming from. And I only, if someone wants help, I'll talk with them. But I think that's the biggest thing that I see in the artistic community. And I think there's – you know, there's some depression as well. But, again, it's it's so interesting because artists, you know, people knock us sometimes, but we're the ones that are really in touch with everything, <laughs> emotions and, you know, and so I think that it's kind of like a cycle. When you're more in touch with stuff, you feel stuff more strongly. When you feel stuff more strongly, you have more symptoms of mental illness, and it's it's all connected. It's all connected. How do they approach managing that struggle and still being productive? Well, you know, I'm not a trained psychologist or anything, but I can say that what I always tell people is take care of yourself first. And it's like when you're on the airplane and they say put the air mask on you before your child. And if you're feeling like you're drowning, I always tell people go get help. You know, there's psychologists, there's psychiatrists, there's naturopaths, there's so many options. 
And I think that some people in the artistic community feel like if, for example, they take medication or they get therapy, that their artistic sensibility will disappear. And, you know, I guess my personal thought is you don't know till you try. And if getting help or getting medication or taking herbs or changing your diet or whatever it is is going to keep you alive and on this planet, then that's what I vote for. So definitely taking care of yourself first. I mean, I'm a mom, and I have many of my musicians that are fathers. I have 12 men that that work for me um, off and on as musicians. And, you know, several of them are fathers. And it's like you can't be a good parent or a good musician unless you take care of yourself. You're absolutely right. If you had a magic wand and could have the impact that you wanted to have with this project, what would you want that to be? Uh, Number one, that there'd be less online bullying, definitely. That people would pause and stop and think before getting irate about little things like there being extra pickles on their burger. I mean, I just see people get irate about the smallest things, that people would step back and stop, put themselves in the waiter's shoes, put themselves in the clerk at CVS shoes put themselves in the car wash attendant's shoes, and just step back and use some kindness. Um, I think also that people would look at themselves and realize that they're not alone. I think those are three different things that I would love, if I had a magic wand for people to take away from the music. And those are three very, very powerful requests. And you would think that given the tools that we have, like you said, Internet, social media, that people should feel like there's always someone that would there to listen. And you would think that with all the productivity gains that we have enough time to be patient. But uh somehow we find ourselves struggling trying to make us uh, make sense of the anxiety that we face in a day to day on a on a day to day basis. I want to say this as an aside, um, having grown up in Oregon, and when I was little, we lived on a farm, I think the number one thing, I do this to my kids, myself, people need to be outside every day. And not only for vitamin D, but just for breathing in, you know, the air that the trees trade off with us, smelling fresh air, listening to the sounds of nature, taking a walk. People are not doing that. And I'm sure there's research about the correlation between stress, obesity, all those things. And so... Anyone listening today, sitting at your desk doing some work, take 10 minutes, go outside and breathe some air or at least do some stretches, something. Even in New York City, I would take my little Maltese, go down my four flights and my walk up and walk around Spanish Harlem, which is where I lived, you know, and there weren't a lot of trees at the time. This is when I was in grad school. There weren't a lot of trees where I was living, but you know what? I walked around and I talked to people, I talked to the donut man. I talked to the, um, the lady selling mangoes in the street corner. So going outside forces you to interact. I learned a really powerful lesson when I was at Accenture. One of my first projects was with a a banking software company called Cervantes in northern Georgia. And the founders started out in their home building this software, and the, the founder's father would cook dinner for them every day. As the company grew, the father continued to cook dinner, and they moved into a headquarters in north Georgia that could accommodate two, 300 people. Uh, they had a practice at, at noon where they would just stop everything. You could not sit at your desk. You had to get outside and perform some sort of activity in nature while the father prepared dinner uh, and lunch for everyone. When you came back, uh, lunch was served, and you had to come down and sit in an open space and talk to people while you ate your, your lunch. And it was uh, the strangest thing because I came in as a consultant to help on a project, and they said, you can't do any work. you got to be just like us. <laughs> but it was funny. I started to look forward to that time of day, to get outside and talk to everybody. It really recharged me, and I took that practice with me to uh, to my startup and telling people, God, get up, walk outside. It makes the technology more meaningful when we know what we're fighting for, which is each other's paychecks. Mm-hmm. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know if that – helped with the you know our um, our mental health but I, I I know I felt stress slipping out of my body every time we we held that practice uh, at the company and and I hope others like you said take from that so we might as well take the time and enjoy real life right yep in real life and I, I wanted to point out one thing uh, there's mental health and then there's mental illness and so I just want because there are also people in my family who have struggled with mental illness and if someone's really struggling with mental illness they can re- they could try all of those things 
and in the end, say with schizophrenia, bipolar, there's so many things, medication is the best thing for them. So I also want someone to know that, you know, you try all these things and you're still feeling horrible and, and blue and all those things. Again, it's okay to go get help. It doesn't mean that you are weak. The strongest people I know are the people that went to get help so that they continue their businesses. When I first connected with you and started working on this particular podcast, that the thing that came to the front of my head, saying that I want people to come in out of the darkness, this is not a, an issue to be ashamed of. It's an issue that everyone should have a positive viewpoint on, just like if you had any sort of physical ailment. Many successful entrepreneurs have successfully managed schizophrenia, OCD, bipolar, because they reached out and got help. In the time we have left, I want to learn more about you. The Ray of Hope Project, I, I was blown away by that. Uh, well, I had been doing a duo with uh, a gentleman, and we've been singing, like, you know, popular songs at restaurants, bars. While my kids were little, it was a good way to make some money. And I think I had taken my kids to it was a living history monument in Massachusetts, and I noticed they had very little African-American anything. And I was, you know, thinking to myself, I grew up in Oregon, but I know there were African Americans in New England. And so I got home and I called some of my friends who live uh, near me who were African American. And a couple of them said, you know, since I was a young child, I stopped going to that place because there's no one there that looks like me. And I thought, you know, let me reach out to them and see you know, what they have to say. So I just wrote them an email and I said, do you ever do, like, black history concerts? Because I sing spirituals and I think that that would be a really nice correlation to what you do. And literally the next day, one of the higher-ups wrote me back saying, oh, my gosh, you've been looking for something like this. Can you come in and do a performance? And that's how it all started. And so I actually, speaking of entrepreneur, I made it seem like I had, a, you know, a spiritual business before I really did. The guitar player I had been doing a lot of duos with, I taught him some of the spirituals. We had a, you know, a powwow session. I did a lot of them a cappella to be historically accurate. And then I put a little twist on it is that I had him, he's Caucasian, I had him do some readings of white abolitionists that were living in the North during that time, and I did some readings of some African-American females, and really I, I centered the concert around educating people that there were a lot of whites up North and a lot of educated blacks up North who were working hard to free the slaves down South. I wanted to show the unity that was happening between blacks and whites, and from there we actually did a gig at a library, and then an agent, an agent found us, an agent out of Boston who does uh, performances in schools. It's her specialty. She signed us, and that's kind of where things started growing. So we started getting, like, assemblies at schools and got some grants to do some museums, libraries, just various performances. I walked by faith and not by sight, Mark. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> wow, wow. <laughs> that's not your typical entrepreneurial path, right? No, it sure isn't. But it was like, you know, I knew that God was speaking to me. It's like, I was given this gift with this voice, and I wanted to make the most use of it to affect the most people possible. And so I just said, I'm going to sing these spirituals because no matter, I could be sick as a dog and sing those spirituals and everything sounds fine. It's almost like, you know, something wow. else starts singing through me. And so I knew that was where I should go, was with those spirituals, and that there were voices of people who never had a chance to be free and their voices needed to be heard. And that it was, you know, my duty, because if I didn't do it, I would be not fulfilling my own potential and that's what kind of drove me i think so you you found your brand in that in that passion and in that connection to that historical period of time and have, have built a, an entire business around that yeah that's and, a uh, that's an amazing journey it's uh it's bigger than i expected you know i just keep chugging along and and trying to do good and um you know it's funny because i wanted a name and my guitar player his name was ray he's in the car with me after a gig and he goes Hey, you're Hope. I'm Ray. Let's say let's call it the Ray of Hope. And that's where the whole he looked up, and there was another Ray of Hope. So I made it the Ray of Hope Project because I was based in Connecticut, and so it became the Ray of Hope Project. And that's so now my name is a part of my company as well. Um, and then it's, so then it's almost like every project I, I do, I say, am I am I being a Ray of Hope? Is this is this a hopeful thing that I'm doing? So that's how I check myself, too. So does your agent now handle all your marketing? Or are there other things that you do to, to build your business? Other musicpreneurs out there who are trying to find their own voice and passion, that they can learn a few tips on how to get their business off the ground. So my agent mostly does the business end of if somebody contacts her, she handles contracts. And then she reaches out to some places as well when she gets grants for things. Um, but as far as the marketing side, you know what really was helpful for me was social media. I had no idea. Uh, some people said to me about mm, 
see, I've been on Twitter for only a year and a half, and I've been on Instagram about the same amount of time. I had a big Facebook following. It wasn't, you know, it was, I don't know, it wasn't producing that many results. I went on Instagram and just started putting a photo up every day, right? So me and myself every day when my kids are in bed putting up a photo. And I actually started booking work off people seeing our little clips, video clips, photographs on Instagram. Then moving over to Twitter, I started writing my thoughts and just random things and started building a following that way. And so I would say, you know, social media is free, cheap to do. I think everyone should have, at the very basic, should have Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. You know, Snapchat is more social, but I I think that's really important. And I still come across a lot of musicians that don't have Twitter. And they'll be like, well, that's because, you know, it's more written stuff. And I'm like, no, it's a whole population of people that don't go on Instagram and don't go on Facebook. And you're missing a pocket. That's how I met you, Mark, was on Twitter, right? That's that's exactly right. (laughs) I also am good friends with one of the best publicists I've ever met. Her name is Dana Swinney, and I couldn't afford her until recently. So um, she and I have been friends for many years. And finally this year I was able to afford her because even though she's a friend, I wanted to pay her what she's worth. And she's been doing incredible work for me, just um, sending out press releases to places. Um, So for me, again, it's a matter of time, right? So as a working mom, how much is my time worth? What dollar per hour is my time worth? And if me paying Dana means that I have five more hours to be with my kids, then that's a choice I'm going to make. So I think for musicians, too, it's, it's checks and balances. It's what can I do by myself that's that's inexpensive, that's a good way to publicize myself, and then as I move forward, can I spend money on other people who really specialize in that? So right now, what I can afford is is a publicist and an agent who she works on commission, but still, that's all I can afford at this time, and so that's fine. That's where I'm at, and it's where it's further than I was a year ago, right? So it's making small goals incrementally. And you you just perfectly summed up kind of one of the my biggest gorillapreneur principles is turn over the work that you believe someone an expert in and let them manage it because it'll give you a higher return and give you back time that you can focus on where you can dedicate your expertise in differentiating your service or product. And it's perfect that you have an agent that works on commission. Uh, you know, we talked in an earlier episode about outsourcing sales to uh, a sales agent that works on commission for companies that have executives who don't know how to sell. That's the best way to go. Mm-hmm. It, that person kind of eats what they earn, and it, it grows in lockstep with your business. And when you hit a certain tipping point in your business where you can have a full-time staff, you know, you certainly can. But up until that point, you have an expert that's working on commission that gives you the lift that you need to get your business from point A to point B. And I'll say to musicians out there, I highly prefer, I'll put it that way because I don't want to dog anyone, so I highly prefer agents that work on commission because if they work on commission, it means they believe in what you're doing because they know they're not going to get paid unless you get paid versus keeping someone on retainer who's going to make money no matter what. You know, and also with her, like she pays for the postage for mailing stuff out or or whatever it is. She does the, um, the research for the map to send my musicians of how to get to a gig, all of those things. And so there's something to be said for that because she's going to work hard. She knows that I work hard. So then everybody benefits from that. Absolutely. Now, do you have any sort of services that you share with other musicians? Um, well, I don't have anyone that works for me full time. I hire musicians by, by job. And so I have about five or six guitarists on the roster, a couple of bass players, a few drummers. I have a percussionist, uh, Ivan Santiago. He's phenomenal. He worked with Sheila E., Pete Seeger. He's just amazing. And so sometimes if I have songs that I want that kind of rhythm, I'll bring him on. The only recording studio I use is called Riverway Studio, and it's in uh, Connecticut. And the man that runs it is named Ira Sikowski. Found him for my album, and he was an investment that, you know, it's how my album ended up getting a gold global music award, some other awards. And so he was the studio producer for IRL. He also, I also gave him a cameo in the music video. Um, he's pretty amazing. So I should do a plug for Iris Sakowski of Rahoy Studio. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> and for me, when I find people that work, I'm extremely loyal. Because it's not, you know, when you find someone that you can work well with who also is technically strong, you don't want to let them go. And I'll say that to the musicians out there. It's fine to do some stuff in your home when you're first starting out, but I highly recommend going to an actual recording studio. You know, the soundproofing, all of that stuff is really important. And that's just another small goal, right? So you start with your home studio because that's something. And as you get bigger, you want to move to an actual professional studio. You seem to have found your target audience both in social media and in your bookings. Where do you see your your Ray of Hope project growing to over the next three to five years? All right, Mark. 
I'm be honest with you. Part of my challenge is that I'm, I give away too much of my money to people, to causes. Like my CD release event was a fundraiser for children of incarcerated parents. I tend to not to give enough money to myself. So actually, one of the things with this video and with future work is that I really want to make enough money to pay for my kids' college education because I think I could be stronger on the business side. Like, how could I make more money for myself? I'm never going to be greedy. I don't want a mansion. I don't need six cars. I don't need all that. I'd rather help people. But I think we have to remember to pay ourselves as well. So I think in the next three to five years, I want to maintain the same message, but I want to also build for my own children's future. I've I've also always dreamed of being a foster parent, so I think I want to be in a position where I am fiscally capable of of being a foster parent. Any more projecting into the future, um, God keeps opening doors. I don't know what doors are going to be open. I'm kind of just riding this wave. Youpromise.com is a website that I found when I, like you, I got a message from God. God said, take this piece of technology and turn it into a company and help make the world a safer place. And it was a piece of biometric technology that we developed into a tool that we thought we were going to sell to eBay, and we ended up selling it to a number of school districts around the country to help them do nationwide background screenings cheaper than they had done at any other time before we showed up. The first week that we implemented the technology down in Florida, it was right after the Jessica Lunsford Act had passed, and this was a young girl who had been abducted by a uh, school employee who raped her and killed her. Well, we implemented our system, and within 12 seconds, we were bringing back results of people who had criminal records that would not have allowed them to be on the school campus. I was brave enough to walk away from a great corporate job to go start something in my garage that would make someone's life safer. Now, one of the things that God did show me in that path was this website, youpromise.com, where I could sign up my credit card, purchase all the stuff that I normally purchase from any other store, Target, Walmart, and they put 5 to 10% of everything I purchase into a 529 account for my kids' education. That's great. And we... We were buying everything for the company through the website. I love it because I have I, I opened up those 529s. I'm always rec- you know recommending them to people, um, but mm-hmm. I like this because this is like painless. You know, I'm the one that puts money into those. I like this because it's like thoughtless. If I sign up stuff, then it just will just go in there automatically, and that's a great. It's, actually, I know it's a plug, but that's a really good plug for us artistic types that tend to forget things. Once we sign up, right. <laughs> the money will just go. It I just like that. go automatically. It's just yeah, like, like cash. That. If you put. If you sign up your Discover card, you get mm-hmm. the you know, cash back from Discover plus the 5% from whatever website you purchase uh, your service or product through. So you can get double the amount back and build up a lot of uh, uh, money in those 529 accounts. All right. I know where I'll be going. There you go. Right? <laughs> so when I saw you singing on Twitter, I said, I, I got to talk to her because anybody that's driving and singing <laughs> – well, got to be my kind of crazy. Okay, so, 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 just for the record, though, I do pull over. So every Monday, if, if you want to follow me on Twitter, anyone, it's just Alika Hope. I started posting a video of me singing every Monday for Music Mondays in my car. And then, yeah, see, Mark, people started being like, I love it. And then when I didn't do it, they'd say, where's my video? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, you know. <laughs> you never. So that's, that, that's testament. That's you never thing. know. Right. You never know what people will like. And I really feel strongly, if you are 100% yourself, you can build a business off of yourself because there's only one you, you know? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. This has been terrific. Tell tell everybody where they can find you on social media. You mentioned your Twitter. Tell us about your Instagram and your Facebook. Where else can we find you? So basically on on. Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook, I'm just Alika Hope. It, uh, Instagram and Twitter, it's one word, so A-L-I-K-A-H-O-P-E. And Facebook, I, I'm the only fan page, and it's just Alika Hope. The Ray of Hope Project is www.rayofhopeproject.com. I'm on Wikipedia if you want to know more about me. I didn't write the article, so I don't know how full it is, but my children found it. On YouTube, I have a channel that's growing. So do host a television show in Connecticut that airs on Fox 61, and there are some clips from some of my segments that are on my channel. How can people find the new single IRL and the video when it drops? So the video will be that, – that, that'll be dropped on YouTube. It will probably go onto Vimeo, but it'll be – it's YouTube first. And then the single 
there was an issue with the uh, distribution with all the different distribution places like iTunes and Google Play and all of that. And so on those locations, it's actually i.r.l. They wouldn't let me just do IRL without the dots. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, but again, it's just under my name, IRL, and it's going to be on everything, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Shazam. You know, I'm really blessed that my parents are hippies, and I'm the only person with my name. Because, again, if you put my name into any of those things, my music will come up. Right. So, yeah. And for branding purposes, they can always find everything connected to Alika Hope. Exactly. So we're going to look for i.r.l on iTunes, on uh, Google Play, on Spotify, uh, all the other platforms. We're going to look for that. We're going to look for the video. Before we wrap up the podcast, can you give us one last message to entrepreneurs and musicpreneurs about the things that you want them to get out of IRL? I want people to understand that kindness is powerful. You may not have money. You may not have much time, but you can always give somebody a smile you can always say a kind word, a kind sentence, and that is the power that every individual on this planet has. Use that power, and you can make a difference in the entire world. Ms. Alika Hope, thank you for agreeing to be on the podcast. We look forward to the, the release of your single and the release of the video. Blessings to you and good fortune, and please sign up for that you promise.com. I will do that. Thank you so much, Mark, for having me on the show. I hope that you enjoyed this episode of the Gorilla Panor Mastermind interview with award-winning singer-songwriter and co-founder of the Ray of Hope Project, Alika Hope. This Mastermind interview was brought to you by Alika Hope and her recently released single, IRL, or In Real Life, and her business, the Ray of Hope Project. Now, here's the second clip. Never let her in, looking over the edge, thinking in death I win. Smile or laugh, try not to frown, don't let this world turn you around. You're not alone in when you cry, virtually I'll be by your side. Smile or laugh, try not to frown, don't let this world turn you around. You're not alone in when you cry, virtually I'll be by your side. Don't let this world turn you around. You're not alone in when you cry. 
virtually I've been by your side. So my electronic to frown, don't let this world turn you around. You're not alone in when you cry. Virtually I've been by your side. That was Alika Hope and her single, IRL, In Real Life. Follow Alika Hope on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Alika Hope. Entrepreneurs, developing a self-care plan is essential to combating mental health issues. Make time for friends, family, and even mental health professionals who can provide you appropriate guidance. In the show notes, I'm going to provide a link to 16 resources that entrepreneurs can use to improve their mental health. Remember to check the show notes for the Amazon Sweepstakes giveaway, and you can always go to my website, sierra.com, to register for our newsletter and a chance to win a copy of Gorilla Panure, Small Business Strategy for David's Wanting to Defeat Goliaths. Gorilla Panure's Scott Sullivan said it best in Episode 7. Be a mace. Sharpen those spikes. And remember, if you're not breaking something, your company might be the next thing that gets broken. Thank you for listening to the Guerrillapreneur, the art of waging small business warfare podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, you may also enjoy the book Guerrillapreneur, small business strategy for David wanting to defeat Goliaths. Available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and iTunes. Follow Mark Peterson on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at, at Gorillapreneur. Now I want to close with a quote from the great Chinese military strategist Sun Tzu. Victorious warriors win first and then go to war, while defeated warriors go to war first, then seek to win. Keep fighting, Gorillapreneurs!